really helpful. Now, if I asked you, oh, <laughs> if I asked you um, uh, to respond to this question, let me see if I can make this work. Bear with. There we go. What would you say? What would you say to that question? What is the most significant event in all of human history? Now, some of you are thinking, well, Steve will say the, uh, the, the first Tesla reaching the road. That is not, that's not what I would say. What do you think is the most significant event in all human history? What would you say? Well, of course, I asked Dr. Google. Um, you, you would, wouldn't you? Just, I thought, I'll, I'll, I'll literally Google it and see what the answer is. So here is what Dr. Laura Whitman said. Tim, I'm not getting any response right now from this. Thank you. She writes this. Throughout the tapestry of human history, certain events stand out as pivotal points that have shaped our world and left an indelible mark on the collective memory of civilizations. These iconic moments range from the transformative to the catastrophic. Yet each one has played a critical role in steering the course of societies and altering the path of humankind. The impact of these historical happenings can be traced in political shifts, cultural revolutions, and the evolution of societal norms. Powerful words. So shall I see what uh, she then says of the top five? Again, Tim, if I pick this up, could you advance it for me? Thank you. The invention of the printing press. That's her number one. Number two, the discovery of the Americas by Christopher Columbus. Number three, the French Revolution. Number four, the Industrial Revolution. Number five, World War II. Now, I'm sure these events are significant but not every historian would agree. I wonder if you're familiar with Tom Holland, who wrote this book, Dominion, The Making of the Western Mind. Have people read that? Have people seen that? No? Okay. It was, uh, it was a fairly popular book, Sunday Times bestseller. Um, well, Holland, he's, let me just say this. I'm going to read uh, something he said. This is not a Christian writer, okay? He is not a Christian writer. He is a historian. This is what he says. We are 21st century people. Richard Dawkins has said, and we subscribe to a pretty widespread consensus of what is right and wrong. Yet what are the origins of this consensus? It's not remotely been a given across the reaches of space and time that humans should believe it nobler to suffer than to inflict suffering, or that people are of equal value. These are convictions which instead bear witness to the most enduring and influential legacy of the ancient world. A revolution in values that has proven transformative like nothing else in history. Christianity. Christianity's enduring impact is not confined to churches. It can be seen everywhere in the West in science, in secularism, in gay rights, even in atheism. It is, so, it is, to coin a phrase, the greatest story ever told. That is Holland, remember, not a Christian writer. That is his, his conclusion. Not the printing press, not even the first Tesla hitting the road. Christianity. Friends, the events that are before us in the pages of Scripture today, and in fact over the next few weeks, are at the heart, right at the heart of that legacy, that revolution in values that has proven transformative like nothing else in history. We're coming today to the second trial of Jesus Christ. Last week, it was the Jewish trial, if you were with us then. Unfortunately, we weren't able to record it, so you can't catch up. But last week, it was the Jewish trial. This week, we pick up at the very next morning. The very next morning. This week, it's the Gentile trial, the trial before the Romans that Jesus faces. The Roman governor of Jerusalem, a chap called Pilate. Well, as Randy reads the events, I have another question for you. 
I want you to think, as she reads it, who is controlling events? Who is in charge of this trial? Okay, so as she reads it, have that in the back of your mind. Who is controlling events? Who is in charge? I'm going to pray, and then Wendy's going to read it for us. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word to us. We thank you for this account of the life of Jesus. And Lord, as we come to this crucial moment where Jesus is convicted to death by the Roman uh, pilot, following the desires of, of the Jewish religious leaders, Lord, this event has changed the course of human history immeasurably. So, Father, we might be reading familiar words. We might be quite familiar with this story. But I pray that today, by your Spirit, you would really stir our hearts to, to hear it, to see the significance in new and powerful ways. If I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh. So today's reading is um, chapter 27 of Matthew, and it's verses 1 to 26. So in your church Bible, it's on page 998. Early in the morning, all the chief priests and the elders of the people came to the decision to put Jesus to death. They bound him led him away and handed him over to Pilate, the governor. When Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that Jesus was condemned, he was seized with remorse and returned the 30 silver coins to the chief priests and the elders. I have sinned, he said, for I have betrayed innocent blood. What is that to us, they replied. That's your responsibility. So Jesus threw the money into the temple and left. Then he went away and hanged himself. The chief priests picked up the coins and said, It is against the law to put this, this into the treasury, since it is blood money. So they decided to use the money to buy the potter's field as a burial place for, for foreigners. That is why it's been called the field of blood to this day. Then what was spoken by Jeremiah, the prophet, was fulfilled. They took the 30 silver coins, the price set on him by the people of Israel, and they used them to buy the potter's field, as the Lord commanded me. Meanwhile, Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Yes, it is as you say, Jesus replied. When he was accused by the chief priests and the elders, he gave no answer. Then Pilate asked him, Don't you hear the testimony they are bringing against you? But Jesus made no reply, not even to a single charge, to the great amazement of the governor. Now it was the governor's custom of the feast to release a prisoner chosen by the crowd. At that time they had a, notor a notorious prisoner called Barabbas, so when the crowd had gathered, Pilate asked them, Which one do you want me to release to you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called Christ? For he knew it was out of envy that they had handed Jesus over to him. While Pilate was sitting on the judge's seat, his wife sent him this message. Don't have anything to do with that innocent man, for I have suffered a great deal today in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus executed. Which of the two do you want me to release to you? asked the governor. Barabbas, they answered. What shall I do then with Jesus, who is called Christ? Pilate asked. They all answered, crucify him. Why, what crime has he committed? asked Pilate but they shouted all the louder, Crucify him! When Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere, but that instead an uproar was starting, he took water and washed his hands in front of the crowd. 
I am innocent of this man's blood, he said. It is your responsibility. All the people answered, let his blood be on us and on our children. Then he released Barabbas to them, but he had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. Thank you very much, Wendy. Let's look at those first two verses again. Early in the morning, all the chief priests and the elders of the people came to the decision to put Jesus to to death. They bound him, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate, the governor. Why the need of this second trial? Why a second one? The reason being, at the time, Israel, I'm sure you know, was under Roman occupation. And the right of execution had been removed from the Jews. So there had to be a Roman trial for Jesus to be sentenced to death. Instead of of then giving us an account of the Roman trial, did you notice how Matthew immediately actually turns our attention to Judas? Judas, remember, had betrayed Jesus to the religious leaders in exchange for a financial bonus. Being a Judas is a phrase, isn't it, that we still have in use today. So next verse is... When Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that Jesus was condemned, he was seized with remorse and returned the 30 silver coins to the chief priests and the elders. I've sinned, he said, for I've betrayed innocent blood. What is that to us, they replied. That's your responsibility. So Judas threw the money into the temple and left. Then he went away and hanged himself. This is what Jesus said Uh, about Judas in chapter 26. When evening came, Jesus reclined at the table with the twelve. And while they were eating, he said, I tell you the truth, one of you will betray me. They were very sad and began to say to him one after the other, surely not I, Lord. Then Judas, the one who would betray him, said, surely not I. Jesus answered, yes, it is you. So, who do you think is in control of events? Who is in charge of this trial? Judas' conclusion, I have sinned, I have betrayed innocent blood, and he hangs himself. Yet, according to Jesus, it was part of the plan. Here's Peter preaching at Pentecost, recording for us the events we've been reading about in Matthew over the last few weeks. He says this, Men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited to you by God, by miracles, wonders, and signs. We've seen that, haven't we, in Matthew. Which God did among you through him as you yourselves know. Now listen to this. This man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge. And you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to a cross. Who is in charge? Who in these events in Matthew is in control? Is it, is it the religious leaders and their kangaroo court? Is it, is it Pilate and his, his spineless fear of the crowd's reaction if he should acquit Jesus of Nazareth? Who's in, who's in charge, do you think? At no point is any of this outside of God's sovereign plan. God is God. God is always in control. In a moment, we'll look at the details of this trial. But we will see never is this anything other than proceeding according to plan. Never outside of the plan for the salvation of humankind that God has had in place since before the beginning of time. You see, on a, on a human level, this looks so hopeless, doesn't it? On a, on a human level, weakness. On a human level, this supposed son of man, God's son, being pushed around at the behest of the religious leaders, his future being settled by a Roman governor. Looks like weakness, doesn't it? Not a bit of it. Not for one moment. 
So ask the question, was the betrayal of Jesus to the authorities through the lies of Judas's lies of Judas, was that was that God's divine plan for all time? Answer is yes. And another one. This man was handed over to you by God's set purpose. So then now I hope that you're asking, well, was Judas's betrayal his doing, his sin, as he seems to think? Was it? Was his betrayal his doing, his sin? He hanged himself. He thinks he's responsible. Is he? Yes, he is. It is God's will that Judas betrayed Jesus. Yes, that's his plan. Is it ever God's will that someone lies and betrays an innocent man? No, it is not. And we have to hold these two things side by side. God's sovereign will, his plan for salvation, was the betrayal by Judas. That was part of the plan. God's moral will, how we, his creatures, are to live, forbids the betrayal of an innocent man. These two side by side. Judas shows us God's sovereignty and human responsibility side by side. Judas shows us Judas is every bit responsible for his sinfulness. He cannot blame God. He is no pawn. His desire was very much to betray Jesus. But in carrying out that desire, he fulfilled God's timeless purpose in, in the saving work of Christ. Do you see that? God's sovereignty and human responsibility side by side. Friends, if this is blowing your mind, it's meant to. You see, God just won't fit into our tidy little boxes that we want to put him in, in our efforts to try and understand the divine. He is creator, we are created. Our finite minds always less than his infinite so you see, Jesus of Nazareth is in control of events, including his arrest, including his betrayal, his trial, and as we'll see next week, his execution. I promised Coops he's preaching next week. I wouldn't tread on his, on his toes for next week. You see, this is not weakness. This is supremely God's power displayed. So these are the most significant events in all human history. No cross of Christ, no resurrection. No death and resurrection, then Jesus is just a hoax, not the Son of God. No salvation. No cross of Christ, no resurrection, no Christian faith exploding across the world. No enduring and influential legacy of the ancient world, a revolution in values that has proven transformative like nothing else in history. Do you see how important this trial is? Not a nod, not a single one. Is it impacting you slightly? This trial that we've just read about, without it, the world you and I know, not as it is, not as it is. The debates of the MPs that, that, are, that are all ranging around social issues, fiscal policies, on health care, immigration and, and how to treat refugees, on the rights and wrongs of high or low taxation, on education, on the NHS, all of those debates, all that they and you and I think about them, entirely because of this trial, Jesus' betrayal, his false conviction, his death, and his subsequent resurrection. The way we are thinking is because of what we're reading about right now. One nod at the back, that's exciting, thank you. Friends, whether you're a Christian with us today or you're still a floating voter on the issue of Jesus, the reality is that all that you know, the Western thinking that underpins society's values entirely because of the man in this text entirely because of that. So the trial of Jesus, not failure, 
but glorious power displayed. Glorious power displayed. And Jesus knows it. Let's see. Let's read on. Meanwhile, Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Yes, it is as you say, Jesus replied. When he was accused by the chief priests and the elders, he gave no answer. When Pilate asked him, Don't you hear the testimony they're bringing against you? But Jesus made no reply, not even to a single charge, to the great amazement of the governor. Accused by the chief priest, Jesus said nothing. Total injustice met by total silent suffering. Jesus in control of proceedings. What is very clear here is that it is Pilate. It it is Caiaphas from last week. It is you and I, the reader now, who is on trial. Jesus, the one with moral authority at his own trial, majestic in his silence. What do you make of Jesus Christ? That's the question. Let's read on. Now, it was the governor's custom at the feast to release a prisoner chosen by the crowd. At that time, they had a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So when the crowd had gathered, Pilate asked them, which one do you want me to release to you? Barabbas or Jesus, who is called Christ. For he knew it was out of envy that they handed Jesus over to him. No other side, please, Tim. While Pilate was sitting on the judge's seat, his wife sent him this message. Don't have anything to do with that innocent man, for I've suffered a great deal today in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas, and get and have Jesus executed. Which of the two do you want me to release to you? Asked the governor. Barabbas, they answered. And I think one more, thank you. What shall I do then with Jesus, who is called Christ? Pilate asked. They all answered, crucify him. Why? What crime has he committed? Asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder, crucify him. When Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere, but that instead an uproar was starting. He took water and washed his hands in front of the crowd. I'm innocent of this man's blood, he said. It is your responsibility. Pilate's custom then to release a prisoner, that was absolute pure politics, okay? He was not popular. There's lots of reasons why that's the case. Not time to cover them today. But to cut a long story short, he needed to ingratiate himself to the Jews who essentially hated him. Well, then the events take this unexpected turn. Did you notice? A message from his wife, Claudia Precula. That was her name. She was actually much better connected than Pilate. She was the illegitimate daughter of Claudia, Emperor Tiberius' third wife. Are you following this? And so she was the granddaughter of Augustus. Basically well connected, all right? So she knows all the top people. So she is probably the reason that actually Pilate, in AD 26, was actually uh, made prefect of Judea. That's the official name rather than governor, the prefect of of Judea. Because he was nothing special, okay? So it was all a bit of nepotism, all a bit of politics. She was well connected. Oh, let's give this chap a decent job. And so he's, he's put him in Judea. Anyway, most like all of us husbands, of course, he didn't listen to his wife. So then there's the crowd. This is the crowd who, not even a week ago, remember, were celebrating the son of David's entry into Jerusalem. We looked at it way back around Easter time, Palm Sunday. Do you remember the cries of Hosanna, scenes of delirious joy? But like a crowd of football fans that so quickly turn on their team with boos or demands for the resignation of the manager, mob mentality prevails. Now they're baying for Jesus' blood. Pilate, of course, wanted to, to evade responsibility for Jesus, whom he rightly saw as innocent. So he takes this unusual step of public hand washing. That is a really unusual thing to do. He knew he had either to sacrifice Jesus 
or to sacrifice his career. He made his choice. But let's not miss the message at the heart of, at the, at the, heart of the cross, which is wound so powerfully into this section. You just can't miss it, can you? Here's the heart of the Christian message. Jesus Christ died on the cross that was meant for Barabbas. One Jesus pillaged and killed Barabbas. The other Jesus loved and suffered Jesus Christ. Jesus took Barabbas' place. Jesus takes ours too. On that Good Friday, one ended up on the cross, humanly intended for the other, and the guilty man walked away free. You see, people are called, aren't they, to choose between these two Jesuses. Friends, you and I, same today. Same today. So, God's saving purpose fulfilled. The innocent Jesus condemned innocent Jesus condemned in exchange for the condemned Jesus's acquittal there is God's saving purpose well, let's read the last two verses all the people answered let this blood be on us and on our children then he released Barabbas to them but he had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified the crowd's response is extraordinary there. That is a very bizarre thing to say, isn't it? Matthew ends this point with a rather casual, but he had Jesus flogged and handed over to be crucified. I mean, on understatements, that's pretty powerful understatement, isn't it? He had Jesus flogged. Even that bit, okay? We're going to look for a moment on this flogging. He had Jesus flogged. Perhaps you think you've got in mind of sort of days gone by when headmasters used to use the cane on naughty children or something. You think, oh yeah, I know what that is. No, you don't. I wonder what it does mean to you, had Jesus flogged. Doubtful we have anything like the right picture of a Roman flogging. I don't know if you've seen the film The Passion of the Christ, Mel Gibson's. I, I watched the scene depicted in that film this week. Well, when I say I watched it, actually uh, I didn't. It was a bit like in the old days when I was a kid trying to watch Doctor Who. I tried to watch it. I'm afraid I couldn't watch it. I just couldn't watch it. I know, that is not great, is it? Not great given, firstly, historians verify the accuracy of the depiction in the film. In fact, most say that even that what Gibson depicts is a sanitised version uh, of, of, for, for modern sensibilities of what a real Roman flogging would have been like. So what the film shows is, is not wrong, or is at least, if it is wrong, is too gentle. Secondly, I'm trying to watch an acted scene. Jesus, my Lord, my Saviour, actually had that done for him. He had it done for him. And shamefully, I can't even bring myself to watch it, to watch a reenactment in which no actor is actually hurt. Despite that, I could neither watch it, uh, and no way could I show it to you today. If you've not seen the movie, then try. Do watch it. It is a very good movie. So here's roughly what it looks like. Two, two guards are tasked to carrying it out Roman soldiers trained powerful men with this gruesome thing called a flagellum so one after the other with all of their strength they would flog the prisoner chained to a post with such intensity you see them there the guards themselves would become exhausted from their efforts so they are hitting the prisoner so hard that they themselves become exhausted it's like a workout for them. The flagellum, I think I've got a picture of that, yeah, so there it is in, as it hits the person. That was made of several pieces of leather with pieces of bone and lead embedded near the ends. And as it landed on the prisoner, the sharp metal and bone dug into the flesh of the victim. 
And as it was pulled away for the next blow, it tore away pieces of the victim's flesh, literally exposing the bone. A flogging was 39 of those. It's no surprise, is it, is it, that prisoners died from a Roman flogging? We cannot begin to grasp the cruelty of the Roman Empire. Holland's book I mentioned exposes the extent of the cruelty of the Roman Empire. Seeing prisoners suffering horrendous agony was sport and entertainment before Christianity. There would have been a crowd watching this and enjoying it. Our Lord and Saviour suffering physical intense agony. It is the influence of Christianity that leads you and me to think that that is horrendous. Jesus endured that for you. Physical agony of such horrendous proportion, I could not bear to watch it, act it out, let alone even show it to us today. He endured that for you for me, if you're a Christian here this morning, if you're trusting in him. But friends, that, that, a teddy bear's picnic compared to the agony of separation from the father that he endured on the cross. We think that is bad. Next week is worse. For all of that, Jesus is in total control. Throughout all of that, God's plan of salvation is being fulfilled. Jesus in control, not only of his life, not only of his betrayal, not only of his, of his trial, of his horrendous treatment, but also of his agonizing death. Throughout the tapestry of human history, certain events stand out as pivotal points that have shaped our world and left an indelible mark on the collective memory of civilizations. These iconic moments range from the transformative to the catastrophic, yet each one has played a critical role in steering the course of societies and altering the path of humankind. I'm going to ask you, how does the printing press compared, compare to the cross work of Christ? How does the printing press compare to the cross work of Christ? Let's take a few moments, uh, perhaps bow your heads, close your eyes, just, or if you want to, just read over those words again. But let's just have, I think we need a few minutes, don't we, of quiet, just to reflect on this before we move on. So let's do that. Let's bow our heads, close our eyes, and ponder what we've just read.